Good morning. <laughs> I'm a tea sipper, so I don't say howdy. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me to come. Uh, it's a great topic. Uh, nexus is a great word to use when you talk about water because obviously it is so interconnected. Um, and there's, there's uh, lots of unintended consequences. That's one thing I've learned in my career. If you do something different, you change how you're managing water, how you're using water, something or someone else is going to be impacted. Uh, for example, if we um, keep uh, wastewater that comes out of our wastewater plants, treat it for reuse, uh, whether to irrigate golf courses or in some cases actually put it back in, directly back into the drinking water distribution system, um, that water is no longer going to the river or the creek. And so it has environmental flow impacts uh, as well as impacts to downstream users. Um, some of the communities in Texas that have um, really done a great job of advancing municipal conservation, have discovered that there's some issues with uh, uh, moving, how to put this politely, solids through the sewer pipes because there's a lot less water coming through those pipes in the first place. And then, um, then even on the uh, uh, pumping brackish groundwater side for desalination can have some unintended consequences in terms of uh, potential impacts on other freshwater resources as well as having to deal with the disposal issue, which that in turn could have some unintended consequences as well. Let me be clear, I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things because there are consequences to it or unintended consequences, it's just we need to make sure that we understand how everything fits together and look at the whole picture in terms of, of if we do something, does it meet our overall goals? And I think that's a, a big part of what, what the intent of this, uh, this conference is about. Um, so, so I'm here to talk to you about supply and demand. Um, I've got to show you this disclaimer. Basically, uh, if you can't read it, it just says if I say something stupid, you can't hold my bosses responsible for it. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good thought. What, what was that? <laughs> it's a good thought I heard from the, from the peanut gallery. Um, so I've, I've, I show this map to pivot from the south, deftly pivot, pivot from the southwest to Texas because my, my knowledge, my experience is mostly in Texas. And, uh, yeah, and in the Southwest, people have different definitions. You know, some of the definitions um, pull in the El Paso area. Some definitions don't include any part of Texas at all. When I think about um, the Southwest myself and thinking about maybe climatological impacts or drought impacts, particularly informed by this uh, uh, droughty cycle we've been in for the last 15 to 20 years, this is kind of how I draw it. Um, I see John Nielsen Gammons here. Um, uh, he, may, he may disagree with this since I'm not, I'm not a climatologist, but when I look at like the heart of the drought in the other Colorado River uh, that, that goes through Arizona, um, you know, it's like a, there's an epicenter there, epicenter there and then it spreads out around that epicenter and based on how we see reservoirs responding, both in terms of when these levels started going down and drought conditions, it kind of reaches by my eyes out through the western, approximately the western half of the state. And then in the central part of the state, you just kind of get this ebbing or this pulsing of that drought coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out. So, so when I talk about the Southwest, um, uh, I'm gonna kind of direct my presentations or, or my comments, kind of that western uh, part of the state. Now, stuff that's clearly in the Southwest, uh, stuff that's happening in the Southwest clearly has an impact on Texas and so, Irrigators um, in, in El Paso um, are affected by snowfall in southern Colorado. So if there's a bad snowfall year in southern Colorado, we don't get a lot of water in Elephant Butte Reservoir, which means um, El Paso and the irrigators down there are gonna be struggling with uh, their surface water supply. Um, we also have um, uh, irrigators that rely on what's happening in the Pecos River in New Mexico in terms of rainfall and snow. Um, Generally, you don't see Mexico lumped in with the Southwest, and the, at least the maps that I see, but uh, clearly northern New Mexico is also in there, and so what's going along, what's happening climatologically can have big impacts on downstream municipal, industrial, and, and, and irrigators, uh, because uh, that little circle I show there, that's where most of the, the water coming into um, Amistad Reservoir and Falcone Reservoir is coming from. There's drought issues there, and there's also international water treaty issues there as well. And then, of course, um, the, the high plains. 
area is uh, in what I've defined as, as the Southwest. And so, uh, so I want to talk about uh, a bit about kind of the water plan, which you, which you heard a little bit about. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into it. And, uh, and in particular, going to talk a lot about the high plains of Texas and the Ogallala. Um, one of my hobbies is I collect artesian well postcards. I've got about 150 of them. There's like, of Texas, I'm focused on Texas, um, could get out of control. This isn't technically an artesian well. This is a well in the Ogallala, Hereford, Texas. Um, but uh, I just like seeing water squirt out on the ground, so, so I bought it. Um, this, was, this made my day when I found this postcard on, on uh, eBay. Um, this is a fellow named John McDonald. And he's credited uh, in Texas for kicking off um, groundwater irrigation, um, really, really in the state, and particularly up in, uh, up in the high plains of Texas. Um, this postcard is from around 1910, so about 100 years ago. Um, he essentially wildcatted a well working with the Bureau of Reclamation um, to show that there was water under the surface. Interestingly enough, back in those days, it was considered shameful to irrigate on the high plains, at least in Texas. I don't know what it was like in Kansas, but um, it, was, it was an admission that the good Lord wasn't providing enough rainfall for crops. And uh, what really was going on was you had a lot of land boosters that were trying to sell land to folks in the east to move out to Texas and start farms. And part of their pitch was, all you gotta do is till the soil, plant some seeds, and you'll be rich. Um, reality, of course, was different. Um, we all know that the climate in Texas can be quite fickle, and we're frequented by droughts, particularly in the western half of the state. And uh, D.L. McDonald, um, I'm sorry, John McDonald was uh, uh, also a land booster, and, uh, and thought, well, you know, maybe we need to do some irrigation. So he wildcatted a well. In fact, his descendants still have a well drilling company in Hereford, Texas. And so that uh, kind of kicked off interest in, uh, in irrigation. This is a plot that shows um, millions of acres of irrigated agriculture in the state, um, starting from about 1890 up to about 2010. And, uh, and so you see uh, things are pretty mellow um, relative to later years. And then starting around 1940, things take off. And then starting 1950, things really take off in terms of irrigated agriculture. And what happened there was, uh, you know, in part, there was reclamation activities in terms of building reservoirs for irrigators. But then the drought of the 1950s hit. And for uh, much of the state, the drought of the 1950s is the, the drought of record. And that really caused some uh, problems for irrigators. A fortunate thing that happened at the same time was a development of affordable downhole centripetal pumps. And so farmers could then start drilling wells and pumping groundwater. And so uh, when you look at, uh, oops. So when you look at the um, uh, percent of the water coming from groundwater, um, by 1950, it was about 10% was from groundwater. By 1960, 74% of uh, irrigated agriculture water was coming from groundwater. And about 75 to 80% of, of all that irrigation is coming from the Ogallala or the High Plains Aquifer. This plot is showing the total groundwater use in Texas. And this is mostly driven by this big leap, is mostly driven again by irrigated agriculture. So not only was there a well drilling boom up in the High Plains, but there was also uh, in the uh, western part of the Edwards Aquifer, west of San Antonio, as well as down in the, the Winter Garden area in South Texas out of the Carrizo Wilcox Aquifer. Um, I was quoted once, unfortunately quoted once, I probably shouldn't say this since we're being filmed, as uh, trying to explain to a reporter, like, why did farmers start pumping water and uh, um, for the drought, and then when the drought went away, how come they didn't go back to doing things the way they're doing it before? And I couldn't quite explain it, and I was like, pumping groundwater is like crack cocaine. You know, once you're on it, you can't get off. <laughs> but farmers quickly realized that this was a cool thing. Um, you know, it, it, it took away the vagaries and the, the fickleness of Mother Nature. And not only that, you could grow, you know, crops that had greater returns, you could get greater, greater yields. And of course, you just spent a bunch of money drilling a well and putting a pump in it, and you still gotta pay the, perhaps pay the bank off, and so you need to be making some money to pay that stuff off. And so, for the most part, farmers have, have continued to um, use the groundwater wells that they've drilled over time. 
So you saw, Dr. Motar showed a, kind of a, an overall percentage breakdown of the projected water demand from the state water plan. I'm showing um, similar information, but this is showing it through the decades. So you can see what the trends look like. And um, that top line there is, is irrigation. And so it's, this is projected water demand. So this is what we think, you know, given the uh, current levels of water conservation, the current ways we use water, here's, here's uh, how we think the demand is going to be for water in the future in Texas out through 2060. Um, agricultural water goes down. I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that is. Municipal demand goes up, which is at second from the top line. And then uh, steam electric is uh, um, fourth from the top. So there's an increase there as well. So let's focus first on the, the irrigation usage. So why is that line going down? Um, why is the demand for, ground, for groundwater, or I'm sorry, for water going down in the irrigation sector? And this is 90% um, of the answer. It's the um, ongoing depletion of, of groundwater in the Ogallala. So this is a plot showing from the water plan what the groundwater supplies are. So this is what we can get out of the Ogallala with existing infrastructure, existing wells. And that's expected to decrease from a little over 4 million acre feet per year to a little over 2 million acre feet per year over time. Um, and so, so that's why in part we're seeing that decrease um, in ag use in time. There's some other um, groundwater, other aquifers where this is an issue as well, but it's really, the signal's really dominated um, by the Ogallala. Little cartoon kind of demonstrating what's, what's happening in case you're not, not familiar. You know, the Ogallala um, or the, the High Plains Aquifer, um, those are two interchangeable terms, at least here in Texas. It's an unconfined water table aquifer. Um, this uh, plot is showing in this particular location in Lamb County. <coughs> um, the bottom of the aquifer, which is the bottom of this map, the red bed. And then from 1950 up to more recent, what's going on with the water table. And so, uh, yep, it's going down every year in, in most of the uh, Ogallala, not all, because there's parts that were, where the water tables are actually rising. Um, but most of the Ogallala in Texas, we're seeing a year-on-year -year decline due to ongoing pumping. Um, our best estimates is we pump about 6 million acre feet a year out of the Ogallala. And uh, the recharge is about 1, 1.1 1 .1 million acre feet per year. So we're pulling out six times what's coming back into that system. Another thing I should note is uh, sometimes when I'm out and about, I'll hear people um, talk about how um, the decrease in the use of Ogallala in Texas is due to the um, cost of energy or the energy you need to pull the water up. I've not seen that in my career. That may be, po that may be possible in the past. I hear reference to that in the past. But uh, my experience in the um, 25 years I've worked in Texas is uh, energy costs are not keeping farmers from pumping water. It's that decreasing saturated thickness where your well yields decrease to a point where it's no longer economic to uh, pump the water or do more infill, infill drilling to, to produce that water supply. Ogallala also dominates, um, given that massive usage for ir ir irrigation, dominates groundwater usage across the state. These are 2003 um, numbers. They're basically the same. I'm lazy, so you know, it ha doesn't, hasn't changed that much. Um, but I would feel uh, dishonest if I just changed that zero next to that three to one. So, <laughs> but know that the signal is uh, it's about the same. I mean, it's, it's a dominated, as far as groundwater pumping, it's dominated by Ogallala. Fascinating statistic to me. It blew, blew me away when I first realized it. Out of all the water used in Texas, 40% comes from the Ogallala Aquifer, just from one aquifer. And then ultimately, groundwater is 80% of uh, uh, all ag use. And again, heavily uh, impacted by the irrigation from the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, even though groundwater is a big, big uh, component of ag use, 40% of municipal supply continues to come from, from groundwater across the state in Texas, including even in the, uh, the wetter eastern parts of the state. Um, because groundwater is distributed, you don't, generally it's good quality, you don't have to treat it uh, a whole lot to turn it into good drinking water. So now let's focus on the uh, steam electric part of this graph. And again, it's that fourth line down. 
So it's uh, roughly increasing from like just under a million acre feet per year to maybe 1.5 million acre feet per year by 2060 in terms of projected demands. Um, one thing I want to note and uh, is that uh, you know we show as far as usage in 2010 we show about um, 400,000 acre feet per year. Um, however, if you go look at different sources or read different sources, you'll find this number, 12.4 million acre feet per year. Um, and, and that's a number from uh, the US Geological Survey, and it's also a number that get, tends to get scooped by others and then used for other purposes. Um, and I remember when I first saw this, I was like, what in the hell is going on here? You know, <laughs> I'll tell you what it is, federal overreach. That's what that is. No, I'm joking. <laughs> What it is, is it's a, a reflection of consumptive use versus total use. So the US Geological Survey, and I give them full credit, you read their report, they're quite clear what it is that they're presenting, it's total use. So whatever water comes into that power plant you know, that they use for cooling, the meter's running there. Um, what, what we do for our water planning is we look at consumptive use. And uh, you know, in Texas, the power plants tend to be, they tend to have their own little reservoirs and so if they're next to the river, they'll pull out water from the river to uh, top off the reservoir, and then they'll pull water out of the reservoir for cooling purposes, put it back into their own little reservoir, run it through, cool it, and then pull it back in. And so the only meter that we have running when we do our analysis is what's coming out of the new source, whether it's a water well, um, but generally for Texas, it's, it's the river nearby. So that's our meter right there. Whereas USGS would have the meter on the intake to the water plant, no matter how many times that water got recirculated around for, for cooling. Um, I think part of the reason they do that is there's plants, particularly I think in the east, where they have more reliable flows of surface water, they have once through cooling. And so your, your power plant's right on the river, you got a river flowing by, the water comes off the river into your, your power plant, cools, goes back into the river and flows downstream. So you've got to have this big, big flow. But even there, it's a little bit of a misleading um, picture because um, you know, only a little bit of it gets consumed coming in and going back out, and that water is still back out there for use. So I point this out as kind of an important thing if, you, if you're reading about uh, Texas and you're thinking, what Robert said, it was 400,000, and, and I'm finding over 12 million acre feet. This is the reason why. I sit on the Advisory Committee for Water Information, which is a uh, advisory group to the Department of Interior and the USGS coordinates that and we've myself and other states have uh, had discussions about a real need to look at the consumptive use and that also becomes uh, an issue with um, agriculture particularly surface water agriculture if water is being pulled off the river is used for irrigated agriculture and the runoff goes back into the river um, perhaps there also needs to be a reflection of what that consumptive use is otherwise uh, you, know, you can freak people out because Based on these numbers, by far, power is the, the greatest user of water in Texas. And uh, open, I got on there, 90% of the water for power does come from surface water. So all those little lines on that plot I showed you that showed ag, municipal, power, um, if we add them all up together, you get that green line, which is the total demand for water in the state, again, according to the state water plan. And so we're looking at uh, you know, an increase from about 17 million acre feet to about 22 million acre feet. The blue line is the water we have now. And so that is uh, the water we have with current infrastructure. So it doesn't mean we can't get more water, but we're gonna have to build a dam, we're gonna have to drill another well, we're gonna have to build a water reuse plant, we're gonna have to implement a water conservation program to get more water. Um, we plan in Texas for a repeat of the drought record at a minimum. Um, regional water planning groups can plan for something worse than a drought of record if they so choose. And, and so those demands reflect that, that drought and the water we have now also reflects what that drought looks like or its impacts on our water supplies. And so uh, ideally we want that lower line to be above that upper line. We want our water we have now to be greater than our demand for water. So in essence, we're not ready for the next drought. Now the good news is is that uh, you know, we do have strategies, we call them water management strategies, to meet most of the needs. Keyword there, most, we'll come back to that. Um, we meet uh, all the needs for municipalities, for industry, for electric power. 
Um, and, uh, and, and these are the strategies that are used to uh, meet many of those needs. Um, conventional supplies, new groundwater wells, we've got desalination, reuse, and then water conservation, of course, is a big one as well. And included in there is irrigation conservation. Um, however, we don't meet all the needs in the water plan, and where we fall short is in agriculture. And uh, in, the, in the parlance of water planning, we call those unmet needs. Um, those are basically their needs that we've identified. Somebody wants water, but we have no, we don't have no idea how to get them more water, or we haven't identified an affordable way to get them more water, or identified a solution to get that water. And so uh, there's 2.5 million acre feet of unmet needs by 2060. Um, the vast majority of that is for irrigation, and most of that is, is from the Ogallala Aquifer. So I'm showing you this plot again to uh, get in your head a couple numbers here. Um, on this projected water demand is about 9 million acre feet in 2060. And then if you add uh, municipal and industrial together, it's, it's also called manufacturing on this plot, it's about 11.5 million acre feet. So 9 and 11.5, keep those in mind. And I'm going to show you this busy plot and, and uh, walk you through it. The, the data up until um, today, uh, 2013 to be exact, the squiggly lines that you see, um, that is actual um, data, actual numbers. Um, Municipal industrial, uh, as a state agency, um, we can uh, survey those uh, cities and companies to get a reports on what their annual water use is. So that's, that's a pretty good estimate of uh, consumption there. Um, the green line is irrigation. Um, it's, it's less pretty good than the municipal. Um, we're, we're not allowed to directly survey farmers on their use, and so we wind up using some uh, roundabout ways to get those estimates. Um, but you know, th those are estimates that we have that are out there. Now, when we take a look at uh, the municipal numbers, kind of the more equally spaced numbers spacing out, both for municipal, industrial, as well as irrigation, what I've done here is I have factored in conservation. So I've taken the demand and subtract it off the conservation, assuming that all the conservation that's in the water plan gets implemented. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing that I've done on irrigation is I've subtracted off the unmet needs. In other words, the needs that we can't find a solution for meeting for the future. Um, I subtract off the irrigation, or uh, I subtract off the conservation. Some of y'all may question that. It's like, well, you're making an assumption that irrigation is is going to ha not irrigation uh, conservation is going to happen in the future, um, and uh, yeah, I'm making that assumption. Uh, the key reason I did that is because conservation is used um, as a way to come up with to meet demand, particularly on the irrigation side, and so uh, so there's there's a folks are counting on that conservation happening um, in order to meet the needs from a dwindling water supply in the Ogallala. And so this is a much more sobering looking plot. And the, the solid lines there are uh, just uh, um, me eyeballing what the trends look like out through 2100. And so, so going back, you know, municipal and industrial, 11.5, and uh, um, you know, it winds up about 10.5 by including in the uh, conservation irrigation. 9 million acre feet as far as the demands, but really where we wind up is a little bit north of 4 million acre feet in terms of actual irrigation production. Um, so I, I point that out that uh, um, when you look at the demands, demands can kind of hide some things. And in this case, particularly unmet needs and then conservation um, that's being anticipated to substitute for being able to produce groundwater for the future. So challenges that's a challenge <laughs> um, that's uh, it's an interesting exercise that I just went through you guys are the first to see it I uh, went through a couple weeks ago because um, uh, um, I've had uh, folks from the environmental sector complain that we don't build in water conservation in our demands for for uh, um, municipal use and so I was like well I wonder what difference that makes 
And then I thought, well, the same thing applies to irrigation. Let's see what that looks like. And uh, that's a little scary. Um, you know, that's going from uh, 8 million acre feet per year, or 6 million acre feet per year, down to a little bit um, north of 4 million acre feet per year. And so that's going to create some real challenges going forward. Um, some folks are appalled that there's these unmet needs in the state water plan. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to think of what the solution is, um, you know, beyond uh, converting the dry land. I don't want to say that that's a solution, and I think there's lots of opportunities, especially for, for smart folks like you all, to help farmers identify solutions. But, but as was noted earlier, a lot of water is needed for agriculture. We're not talking barrels or gallons, we're talking acre feet of water. A little bit of history, um, and, and this is a problem that the, the states and, and people in Texas have recognized for a long time. Uh, going back to the 1968 state water plan, there was a proposal to bring water from the Mississippi River over to the, uh, the high plains of Texas, as well as uh, down along the coast, down to the valley. And you can follow the lines, and pretty much it's going everywhere. Um, but uh, horribly expensive. Um, and that's, that's the other thing, ag needs cheap water. And the, the, the point was made earlier about um, desalination for agriculture is, is uh, uh, probably not gonna happen because it's, it's really expensive for agricultural purposes. More affordable for municipal industrial purposes. Um, this project was anticipated to bring 5.8 million acre feet per year. Um, um, this is, I'm just talking about that northern bit up there. 1,400 miles of pipe, 71 pumping stations, um, 6.3 billion in 1968 was the estimated cost. Uh, just doing a straight conversion, close your eyes economists, just doing a straight conversion, 43 billion in, in 2015. That is almost surely an underestimate. Um, this, the 6.3 was criticized as an underestimate back in the day. And uh, I would say things are a lot more expensive and more difficult to do these days than it was back in the 60s. Um, $300 per acre foot in 1968. Uh, you convert that straight to $2015, that's $2,000 an acre foot. That's, anybody know a farmer that can afford $2,000 an acre foot of water? <laughs> um, yeah, one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges I think also is, uh, you know, getting folks, or continuing to move towards getting more and more efficient. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of farmers that do a really good job of, of doing things efficiently. You know, can, we, can we do better? Yes. Um, you know, my understanding is there's a lot of farmers that are up in that uh, LEPA space in terms of their irrigation on the high plains. And so you know, properly run, you're looking at, at a potential of 95% efficiency. You, know, you could go to drip um, and, and increase that even more, but uh, you know, you're really going to get there. And so maybe I know there's some folks doing uh, work on more drought tolerant um, crops. You know, that, that may help things for the future for, for Texas. Um, our agency um, works with um, um, local entities on demonstrations to try and get uh, producers to uh, see for themselves um, boots on the ground, uh, ways to use water more efficiently. This is a, just a picture of a project we have in, in, uh, down in the Lower Rio Grande Valley. We also have a, a project outside of Lubbock area um, looking at, at uh, applying what's learned in academia out in the field to where producers can come in and see it and then hopefully adopt it and take it out. I think the qu point was made earlier about the need to help, I guess, transfer knowledge to the people that are actually using water and that, you know, that continues to be a struggle. Um, and so we're doing a bit on our part to help, help that happen for the future. Uh, this is showing ag water use, our estimates of ag water use um, over the last 13 years, and uh, kind of point this out to uh, note 2011, where that was the, the um, single worst one-year drought in Texas history, and, and uh, pretty much the start of the four or five-year drought that we, we were in and have just come out of over the last year. And, uh, and so obviously with drought, folks pump more, um, and so there's definitely a, a climate connection there with how much gets produced from the aquifer. And of course, uh, as I just told you, you know, pumping more from the aquifer is a good thing in the short term, probably not a good thing in the long term. Another thing that we gotta be thinking about or it's a challenge is that you know, we plan for drought a record, and uh, Representative King alluded to this, 
you know, our record goes back to the late 1800s. And, uh, you know, we've seen a doozy drought, 1950s, six, seven year drought. Um, you know, this recent drought we went through, it, had, it would have to go another two years on a statewide basis to uh, rival that 1950s drought. So it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a good drought to be planning for, I think. But you go back in time looking at the tree rings and you can see, you know, we've had 20, 30 year type droughts out there. Um, you know, not to mention what might happen in the future in terms of climate. The other thing that, that uh, you know, we have to be concerned about is, is uh, um, groundwater declines across the state. Um, this is a map showing um, our estimate of total water level declines in the major aquifers of Texas. And uh, one thing that might surprise you is I've just been beating on the Ogallala about how much we're pumping from the Ogallala, and it doesn't look so bad on this map. Your eyes are drawn to Dallas, Fort Worth, and Waco. What the hell are they doing over there? Um, need to note that geologically or hydrogeologically, state's very different in the eastern half. We have uh, artesian aquifers, dipping aquifers towards the Gulf Coast. It's artesian water. Uh, for the same amount of pumping or even much less pumping, you get a lot more water level decline and much broader impacts versus the Ogallala Aquifer, which is uh, not under pressure. You're physically draining the pores out as you pump it. Um, and so in you know, Dallas-Fort Worth, we have uh, over 1,000 feet of hydraulic head decline or water level decline in those wells. Um, you can also see, uh, I don't think my arrow shows up for you all, but in the Houston area down along the coast, you can kind of see the Houston pumping um, down towards uh, Mexico. You'll see a Kona depression down there, and you're looking at, uh, uh, at this point, that was all um, irrigation um, um, declines. Um, well, I wish my pointer worked because I could point out what the Aggies are doing to their aquifer. But, <laughs> but there's a Kona depression around Bryan College Station as well. Um, here's a hydrograph for the Carrizo Wilcox aquifer, and um, uh, showing um, you know there was, was a general trend decline. Uh, you know, pre-2010, 2011, and then you definitely see a precipitous decline after that. And, uh, and again, we're looking at uh, um, um, water, groundwater being pumped for hydraulic fracturing uh, on top of a drought hitting. So you had elevated pumping for irriga irrigated agriculture, and then you also had uh, this th new demand for water um, for, the, um, for hydraulic fracturing. The point was made earlier that on a statewide basis, Water for hydraulic fracturing is not that much. It's actually about 0.6% of the state total water consumption. Um, but indeed, the comment is true that when you get down to a local basis, the pumping is more focused and, and there are, uh, it is having some, some impacts. I probably need to correlate that with the price of gas, maybe. I don't know. Um, here's uh, Elephant Butte Reservoir, which also is showing a you know, climatic signal, and of course we still have irrigated agriculture that uh, um, relies on surface water in the state. Uh, we've got rice farmer farming in Texas. Um, we've got uh, down the Lower Grand Valley, up in the El Paso area that I mentioned earlier. And uh, you know, what is going on with drought and climate certainly has a big impact um, on, on the, and here you can also see that, uh, you know, when the drought was starting out in the southwest Texas, you certainly see a signal um, right around uh, 2000, well, yeah, right around 2000 on Elephant Butte Reservoir, and it's gone up and down a little bit, but certainly not what it was before. Then, of course, there's a loss of irrigable land. Uh, this is a neat, neat uh, figure that shows light. So it's urban areas measured by light, and uh, and so whenever yeah these cities are growing, we're losing irrigable land, which is kind of another little, little interesting nexus that's out there. Um, brackish aquifers are out there. The point was mentioned that, that we can't, uh, we're not going to be able to replace Ogallala pumping with desalting brackish groundwater, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, some, some folks will come to me saying, we can just, all we need to do is just pump that Dockham water, desalt it, and we'll use that for, for irrigation. And, and many problems with that, you know, first off is the cost, and then also the yields are nowhere near as high as the Ogallala. Um, I do wonder, and I need, a, I need a, an Aggie to tell me if I'm crazy or not, but yeah, I do wonder if uh, folks up there at some point could, could do um, greenhouse type, type um, 
agriculture and what, what the cost of water needs to be to do something like that. So with that, um, hopefully giving you a big overview about uh, um, maybe a little more insight into the kind of the demand numbers, the unmet needs, and maybe what the, according to the water plan, what the future might look like for irrigated agriculture, um, as well as uh, um, some insight into the power and how, how we look at the power water consumption versus how the uh, um, USGS looks at it. And, uh, you know, given some ideas out there, there's, there's clearly a need for folks to do more work in trying to uh, solve the water issue with with uh, the high plains. Um, you know, farmers are doing the best they can. They're a pretty resilient bunch, um, but uh, more work clearly can be done. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.